Greetings, everyone. Happy New Year. Uh, this is Employment Friday. Uh, so In the Know with Kathy Wood uh, is today. And as you know, we normally go through fiscal policy, monetary policy, economic indicators, market indicators, and then uh, a bit about uh, innovation. Uh, and we are going to do that. Uh, but today we have a very special guest. Uh, he is our Director of uh, Digital Assets, uh, Yasin Almandra. Uh, this is a very important time, uh, we think, in the history of a new asset class. And so uh, we wanted to, I wanted to bring Yasin on in, into the In the Know so that you are in the know um, if you are a bit curious about Bitcoin. And so, Yasin, welcome. Thank you, Kathy. Great to be on. Really excited about this conversation that I'm about to have with you. Coming into 2024, uh, obviously a wild year. Uh, we actually just published, as you know, you were on it, the Bitcoin yeah. Brainstorm, our sixth episode. And uh, we had some awesome guests on, uh, really talking about what's to come for Bitcoin in 2024. And so I thought maybe we could really kind of start there. Uh, the conversation. There's uh, tons of elephants in the room. Obviously, our, our history with Bitcoin uh, dating back to 2015, really reaching a, a beautiful kind of culmination or tipping point here um, with a, an impending potential Bitcoin ETF approval. Um, so why don't we start there? Why don't we ju jump right into it? Perhaps give the audience a little bit of context as to our relationship with Bitcoin, which dates back to 2015 and fast forward to 2024 and some exciting times ahead. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on everything going on here? Well, actually, my history with Bitcoin goes back to 2011, uh, before we started ARC. Uh, Brett Winton and I were at another firm, and we were talking about this curiosity called Bitcoin during our research meetings. Uh, and then when I founded ARC in 2014, uh, Brett uh, joined me, and... Uh, we decided not to split the next generation internet, which was a big theme of ours, into what has become uh, uh, Bitcoin, crypto assets, digital assets generally, and artificial intelligence. Uh, but when we understood in 2014 and 15, as we did our first white paper, how big this was going to be, and we, and we really learned it with Art Laffer, uh, who's been my mentor throughout the years from an economics point of view. He's a good friend. Uh, and I just uh, wanted to, to share this concept with him. And then when he found out what it really was, he did want to collaborate on the paper with us. And so our first white paper was in 2015. Uh, and we took our first position, giving our clients exposure to Bitcoin, in September of 2015, when Bitcoin was roughly $250. And it was really interesting at that time. We had been around for roughly a year, a little more than a year as a firm. And when we put Bitcoin in the portfolio, I remember the media, some people in the media were saying, oh, well, that's great. They're just trying to get attention. This is a great marketing gimmick. And that's when I realized, oh my gosh, this could be even bigger than we think. People are making fun of us. And, uh, and so, uh, there began our journey and we've been there ever since. And uh, I can tell you our conviction has never been higher. That, that narrative evolution, I think, should not, um, you know, go unnoticed here. If we think about the last 10 years where Bitcoin goes from, you know, this, this weird magic internet money to, you know, this weird yeah. asset that's for drug lords and criminals and terrorists to a speculative a asset for, you know, hobbyists. So now a very strategic addition to a diversified investment portfolio. I think you see Bitcoin's resilience in 2022 after the massive contagion that we saw. Not only was Bitcoin operating, uh, but it was thriving. And in 2023, I think people started to realize that and that was reflected in price. Coming into 2024, especially with this, you know, Bitcoin spot ETF approval. You know, why, why don't we talk a little bit about that risk off narrative that has yeah. evolved, you know, starting with the, the trigger of the regional bank collapse and, and your, your thoughts there? 
I, yeah. also, I also say that I, I, I want to say that because it, it might be helpful for the audience to provide context as to that 2015 position in the midst of the Greek, uh, you know, sovereign debt crisis and how that was yeah. a, a, a real eye opener for us uh, when we when we took that first position. Absolutely. I see. And so, yes, when we took our first position, it got a lot of publicity and it was highly criticized, uh, especially from other uh, asset management firms, I would say. Uh, and so we were watching Bitcoin like a hawk and and uh, there was the European sovereign debt crisis uh, threatening to rear its ugly head again. And so we were watching what happened to the Bitcoin price as the markets elsewhere, whether they're the sovereign wealth bonds or the stock markets themselves uh, were imploding at times. And Bitcoin was inching up and we thought, oh, that's so interesting. And we began to think, okay, could Bitcoin be not only a risk on asset, but a risk off asset? And it's the first time uh, that I remember saying, you know, this could be a hedge against counterparty risk in, uh, in an implosion of the financial ecosystem. And it was acting that way. So most people, as they were being introduced to Bitcoin, were introduced to it as an inflation hedge, a hedge against inflation. Uh, we were looking at the sovereign debt crisis and saying, wow, it's behaving very interesting. This is the threat of deflation and it's doing very well. And then of course we had uh, the sovereign, I mean, the regional bank crisis this year. And uh, lo and behold, it was uh, after, especially after 2022, where we had Terra Luna, Celsius, uh, th uh, uh, Three Arrows, FTX, uh, you know, basically going under. Uh, and here, as the regional bank index in the United States was imploding, actually, Bitcoin went up 50%. And then we said, aha, there was a trace of this back uh, during the, the 2015 time period. But this was, hey, Bitcoin, now we know, is not only a, a risk on asset uh, and does very well typically uh, as, um, as, as some other markets are doing well, but it, it, it charts its own course. Uh, and it is also a risk off asset. How many assets are there like that out there? Uh, so big aha moment last year. I really think that that moment will, will go down as the event that really marked the perception shift from Bitcoin to being risk on to both risk on and risk off. And now, can, can, I, yeah. can I just say something about that? Uh, to help people understand, first of all, what were we saying about FTX? and all of the, the bad news last year, we basically said, this is proving the point, the reason Bitcoin is important. FTX was completely centralized, yep. completely opaque, and it turns out completely fraudulent, right? Uh, and what do we have in Bitcoin? It is completely decentralized, completely transparent by digital wallet, uh, address and uh, and basically a giant neighborhood watch system because there are so many people watching now people's who people whose livelihoods depend on this not just in the developed world but especially in the emerging markets uh, so it helped us prove the point and then on deflation what do, what was that point well there is no counterparty risk uh, with this transparent uh, um, uh, decentralized ecosystem. Unlike our banking system circa 0809, counterparty risk was the reason uh, the financial markets seized up and were paralyzed and why the, the financial authorities and fiscal authorities had to come to the rescue. That will not happen with Bitcoin. That's absolutely right. I, th I think it's worth unpacking that a little bit further because you, you basically outlined one of the several characteristics you know, that we've defined 
as what makes uh, an asset actually risk off, right? To your point, you want an asset that provides this safety or this capital preservation. Bitcoin does exactly that, given it's a decentralized network. It's independent of any single entity. And I think you hit the nail on the head that makes it uh, a natural protection against counterparty risk and, and arbitrary asset seizure. Then you look at things like diversification, right? You want a risk off asset that, that is, you know, uncorrelated to traditional asset classes. You look at the last five year rolling correlation of Bitcoin relative to traditional asset classes, and you find that it, it, it performs uh, relative to other asset classes. The, the, it has the, it's the most uncorrelated or presents the lowest correlation against traditional asset classes. And so now when you're an institutional allocator looking just to diversify your portfolio, Bitcoin, including that, is is definitely a, a, a risk off um, narrative that that has matured. Then you think about things like long ter- having a long term investment horizon. You know, people tend to look at Bitcoin's short term swings, but over the long term, you know, it, it it's been able to preserve capital as this compelling store of value, um, unlike any other asset class. Un- unlike any other asset class, and uh, I'm really excited that you're updating the paper we wrote in 2020. Actually, you wrote <laughs> in 2020. Uh, which which uh, put forth this case for uh, not only institutional investors, but retail investors, of course, right? Uh, so we're updating that, how well uh, it diversifies portfolios. And what that means is it increases returns per unit of risk because of the low correlation to other asset classes. So um, I'm excited for that paper. And I'm also so excited for some of the uh, big ideas uh, that we're going to put out, uh, I guess it's in a few weeks, uh, that will help um, help people really understand this story. Absolutely. Lot, lots of exciting research to come. I think, you know, you have the Bitcoin spot ETF approval, you have institutional acceptance, you obviously have the Bitcoin halving, and maybe we can we can end on that note. This this yeah. this uh, Bitcoin halving, which is a scheduled event that occurs approximately every four years, uh, is is expected to occur in in April of this year. Um, and I, th- I think it's 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 quite a, a provocative uh, event in that it it reinforces Bitcoin scarcity and that it is effectively the most predictable monetary system relative to its monetary policy uh, the world has has ever seen. Um, and so, so, so yeah. see, just to get uh, to to uh, help explain that a little bit, the having means the rate of growth in supply is going to be cut in half. Is it to zero point four or zero point five percent? So reduced from about one point eight percent to zero point nine percent. So okay. just one percent inflation per now. year. Per year, right. which means which means if you compare this to gold, gold supply has increased on average roughly one percent per year. Bitcoin's supply growth is going to drop below that, we believe, this year. And historically, what's been interesting is that each halving event has, has followed pretty significant increases in, in Bitcoin's price. Uh, and so it tends to be sort of the beginning of a, a bull market. I'll, I'll quickly share a chart that I think uh, evokes this exact idea, um, it, which is the MVRV um, uh, metric, which is an in-house metric that was created by our on-chain associate, David Puell, that effectively shows um, you know, where holders are relative to the market cap. Uh, when they are under profit, that tends to be uh, significant, signifying a bear market. And when they are above profit, that's, that tends to signify a risk on or bull market. Uh, and you can see this threshold of uh, this zero line here where 2023, we really broke out of that risk off territory and have been following a, a pretty consistent upward trend in, in relative and in profits relative to market price. I think what's particularly noteworthy in this chart are, are these vertical purple lines, which actually denote when the previous Bitcoin havoc events were and how they've coincided with the beginning of, um, you know, new uh, new highs for for Bitcoin. Um, you can see in in, uh, in 2020, the, the last Bitcoin having right just after COVID, you know, Bitcoin um, issuance rate was cut in half and you could see kind of price follow pretty provocatively from there. The same applies to uh, in 2016 and in 2012. 
Um, so I think this chart really kind of lays out um, some some good context as to just how important the, the, these events are as catalysts for uh, new markets, uh, the, these new market cycles, and how Bitcoin has followed this four-year market cycle um, to the T in, in, a, in, a, in a beautiful way, I'd say. And then maybe to wrap it up, I think what's a really interesting dynamic that we haven't seen in previous market cycles is the buyer and seller behavior broadly is much more long-term focused than it's ever been. Uh, this chart, it, it shows the chart of total long-term holder supply overlaid by Bitcoin's price, um, which now stands at around 15 million or 76% of Bitcoin's circulating supply. So in, in other words, we're basically saying that 76% of Bitcoin supply are held by long-term holders. This suggests that the, 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 that 76% is locked uh, in a way that you, you're, not, you're not going to see marginal demand uh, be, be absorbed by it by this, the, the supply. The supply is relatively finite relative to what we've seen in previous market cycles. Uh, it's interesting to note here as well that in, in market tops or in really bull markets, we see a decline in that uh, long-term holder supply, largely because long-term holders are taking profits. Here we have yet to see that decline, which again denotes that you know, despite being up you know, several hundred percent in a year to date or in 2023, that we're still likely not in sort of the euphoria territory and that this might actually be just the beginnings of a bull market if we were to look at long-term holder supply as a, as, a proxy for, um, as a proxy for risk on versus risk off narrative. The, the thing that strikes me about this is, is just to, you know, you, you said it, 75% of the outstanding supply of Bitcoin is in the hands of long-term holders. And I think what that means is this, uh, they've held it, have not moved it in a, about a year? Or, that's or right. is it, it's over, it's yeah. about over a little over six months. The year supply, that's about 56% of total supply has not been, has not been moved in over a year. Uh, but we used her heuristics where this, this, that six month threshold tends to be the long-term versus short, short-term demarcation. So, so there, they, I'm just looking at the number here, about 15 million right. of the, the Bitcoin supply out of 19 and a half million outstanding is in the hands of strong holders. And, uh, and we know that the total supply mm -hmm. ever is going only to 21 million. So pro to pry it out of the hands of these long-term holders now that institutions are going to be given, we believe, the green light by the SEC uh, in, we, we hope and believe, the next week. Um, the price uh, they're that they're going to de demand now that this asset is so scarce and, and the push in from institutions, uh, it won't happen all at once right away. You know, there are lots of boxes to check and so forth. Um, but uh, I think the long-term holders understand there's a big buyer on the way here. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think 2024 is certainly an exciting year. Uh, and January is an exciting month uh, just because of all of the, the, the talks around a Bitcoin spot ETF approval. As you mentioned, Kathy, we have big ideas coming out. We have the Bitcoin Monthly that we publish every single month that gives a lay of the land on the economic state of Bitcoin. And then we have Bitcoin Brainstorm that we publish every month as well. The sixth episode is out this, uh, this today. Uh, and expect a, a lot more research uh, around the, these conversations in the coming weeks and months. We're, we're very excited. Uh, and um, that's, uh, we'll, see, we'll see what happens in this next week, Kathy. Thank you so much, Yassi. And you are leading the charge. And uh, uh, I couldn't be more grateful to you and your team. And uh, you're right. I think uh, this is going to be one of the most interesting and exciting periods in investment history. Okay, and now back to our regularly scheduled programming. Uh, I will make it brief this time. Um, well, first, the summary is uh, that last year, 2023, clearly the markets uh, started to understand that the Fed was just about done uh, raising interest rates. Now, the Fed kept saying higher for longer, and some Fed members were saying 
Uh, we've got to raise interest rates higher. Certainly Larry Summers, who's not a member of the Fed, but seems to influence them, was, was saying that. But the market started to see through that. Uh, and I, I do believe that 21 and 22, which were terrible years for long duration assets, uh, our kind of strategy, long term bonds, the worst bear market really in history since the 1700s, um, we've paid our dues. And now I do believe that what we were uh, projecting or forecasting uh, and have been for quite some time is that uh, inflation, when history is told, inflation was transitory and uh, a function of a supply shock and supply chain bottlenecks, uh, and that it flipped pretty quickly from inflation down to 2%, past 2%, and into negative territory. That's what we think is going to happen this year. So uh, I, I think um, the Fed will take note. And then uh, the other thing that we believe uh, will with history as our guide, become obvious, is that we've been in a rolling recession uh, for roughly two years now. A uh, number of housing measures are down 40%. New and existing home sales are as low today as they were at roughly the depths of the 08-09 uh, crisis. Uh, we've seen uh, auto sales not get back to... Uh, the normal 17 and a half, uh, 18 million unit range. We're in that 15 and a half, 16. So that's recession like. Commercial real estate is in a world of hurt. And uh, I think what's going to happen now companies are losing pricing power, they're going to have to cut prices. Uh, they see that when they don't cut prices, their units fall apart. And I'll show you some slides on that in a minute. And uh, so they're going to get religion. And in order to salvage margins, what will they do? They will start cutting back on employment. And the unemployment rate will continue to go up. It's still at very low levels, but it has turned the corner. Uh, I'm not thrilled about that. Uh, I just think the Fed overdid it. I don't think this was necessary, but uh, we do think it's going to happen. Uh, the recession will not be as serious as 08 or 09, uh, nothing like it at all, uh, partly because we've been through a rolling recession, and this will be the tail end of it. Uh, and so that, too, will move the Fed. Um, and so we think interest rates are going to surprise on the low side of expectations as inflation and real growth surprise on the low side of expectations uh, in an election year. So that's pretty uh, interesting. Okay, so now we're going to skip through some charts here. And um, again, um, I'll make it shorter than, than normal. Uh, but uh, starting with fiscal policy, here is the chart that uh, has, has really charged uh, the political debate. You can see for the first time in history our debt, our total public debt, this is federal debt, um, uh, has crossed over. It did so, it was threatening to do so in the last five to 10 years. It did so decisively during COVID. Now, one thing about this is these are two different kinds of measures. Debt outstanding is, is a, a, what, what they call a stock. It's, it's an absolute number, level of debt. GDP is more of a flow. It is a measure of the goods and services produced in any year. Uh, and if we're dealing with a quarter, it's annualized. So again, any year. So different kinds of statistics. I think the debate is, um, is, is uh, serious, but... Um, I, I don't think it is as serious as many think it is if we are right uh, that innovation solves problems and we're going to go into a period thanks to 
unbelievable amounts of innovation. You just heard uh, about Bitcoin. Um, uh, we believe that real GDP growth is going to be turbocharged. Uh, so the 3% that we've seen on average over the last 100 years in real GDP growth, we think is going to be much higher going forward as these innovations hit critical mass. And all of them are moving into prime time. So, uh, and then you can see on this next page what I mean. So this is public debt outstanding. Uh, so that purple line on the, the previous chart, divided by GDP. And uh, I do remember being starting my career in the early days of the 80s. And oh my goodness, the debate was supercharged then as well. And what happened was uh, Reaganomics or supply side policies did turbocharge growth in the 80s and 90s. And uh, and with a lag, we began to see the leveling out of this uh, of this metric. We think there's going to be so much growth, so much more than even in the early 80s, that this line, debt outstanding to GDP, is going to come down fairly dramatically now that there is gridlock in Washington. And and we believe that that grid gridlock will be sustained during the next five to 10 years. Okay, so then on to monetary policy. Here, the purple line is money growth. And you can see the money growth rate is negative uh, and it turned negative. Um, this, this we've pushed money growth forward, but it turned negative um, at the end of 22 and was negative throughout 23. We've pushed it ahead by 18 months and then put where we are with CPI inflation uh, on top of it. Money leads inflation. And you can say, see what this chart is saying. We, it is very likely that we, will, we are going to move into negative territory when it comes to inflation in 24 and 25. And we would not be surprised to see an overshoot here. And that will provoke a significant Fed uh, reversal in policy. Uh, on this page, this is the yield curve, and um, the yield curve, the zero measure there, anything below is an inverted yield curve. And you can see we've had an inverted yield curve uh, by this measure, which is the 10-year Treasury yield minus the two-year Treasury yield, um, for 18 months, roughly. Um, it's quite a long time, and it's reminiscent more of what went on in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, and we ended up in two recessions in, in 1980 and 81 back then. Um, so this would suggest that uh, we're going into recession. The only um, consideration here, though, is if falling prices um, do ignite unit growth, meaning the unemployment rate doesn't go up too quickly, and corporations really start to understand that they can drive unit growth if they cut prices, um, that could be what this is signaling. We'll have to see. Right now, we do believe uh, the higher probability is a recession. And then on this chart, just to give you a sense of the drama here, uh, this is the number of consecutive days that the yield curve has been inverted. And you can see the, the three most serious recessions that we've had in post-World War II experience um, uh, are the 73 to 75 recession, uh, the 1980 to really it was one big uh, recession um, from 80 to 83. And then you can see where we are now. It's even more in terms of consecutive days than uh, 08, 09. So if you were using this chart alone, you'd say, oh, my goodness, what kind, what kind of recession is this going to be? Um, again, we've been through a rolling recession. I think that's partly what this uh, chart is telling us. And we don't think it's going, the recession is going to be severe, uh, but uh, it is going to be uh, something the Fed will have to address. Um, here is the Fed, Federal Reserve Bank of New York uh, recession probability. Uh, it has been saying for quite some time that we're going into a recession. And in fact, um, late last year, 
we got to a level where we had only been in the early 80s before. So, but but these votes at the Fed have been unanimous, which is kind of crazy, um, because each of the Federal Reserve banks has their own uh, economist, economic department, and each one of these Federal Reserve banks, most of them, I would say, uh, would tell you that their indicators were flashing red, and not just for the last few months, but for the last year. So I just think this Fed did not want to be saddled with letting the inflation genie out of the bottle. They didn't want that reputational risk. They were really thinking about themselves and they weren't looking at these indicators, economic indicators. Um, all right, so let's go through a few here. Leading economic indicators. Now you can see here, we've been negative for quite some time. We're down to a level which in the past, every time we've been down here, we've ended up, we've either been in a recession or we were uh, soon to go into a recession. So this is a uh, recession indicator. Here is what has been the showstopper for many. And in fact, today, Janet Yellen said, yep, we accomplished a soft landing. Uh, I think she's going to uh, have to change her mind on that. But um, you can see jobless claims have started moving up, but they're still quite low by historical standards. Uh, at the, this is continuing jobless claims. I initial jobless claims would show the same thing, but it would show uh, uh, recently another downturn in initial claims, which means the employment situation is getting better. These are insurance claims when people... Um, are jobless, they can file for, for insurance. Um, so continuing claims are moving up. Initial claims are equivocating and we get them weekly. And of course the market micro uh, analyzes them weekly. Here is temporary help employment um, versus total employment. And you can see total employment is the green and uh, it's still moving up. We got a, a report today actually that had something for everyone. If you looked at uh, if you looked at non-farm payroll employment, which is what the green line is here, it was up. It was higher than uh, forecast. At I think it was two hundred sixteen thousand. Expectations were one seventy five, but revisions took the net down to one forty six. So revisions, and in fact, uh, we didn't put it in here, but job revisions to the downside have never been as um, as strong, meaning the downward revisions have never been this steep to the downside ever. Um, and temporary help employment, which is the purple line, uh, corroborates uh, this notion that uh, employment is fraying at the edges and household employment today was down, um, I think roughly 700, by 700,000. So it d disagrees, and that's a household survey versus a corporate survey. Uh, they are disagreeing right now. Um, and so, again, something for everyone. Wages higher than expected, hours less than expected. So, again, something for everyone. Now I'm going to show you a few charts from our friends at uh, Piper, uh, Nancy Lazar's economic team at Piper, um, and uh, let me show you uh, some of their charts. The, now, we're looking at companies uh, reporting. We listen to all of these earnings calls, and so just pulling a few out. Now, we don't hold either one of these stocks, FedEx or General Mills, uh, but I was struck by, by these uh, charts. Look at uh, FedEx's um, revenue growth in real terms. So they had been relying on pricing. What happened? Businesses pulled back and said, no, we will send it slower delivery, uh, maybe even snail mail. And you can see uh, sales are down 13% and they're below trend. And from their latest quarterly report, it seemed like they did not see much of a recovery. Uh, and then uh, if you look on the right, this one is really shocking. This is General Mills, their real revenue. A lot of Staples companies jacked up prices because they felt they could. And look at what is happening to their unit growth. Uh, it's off the cliff, off the cliff. And consumers are trading down to store brands. 
uh, and uh, General Mills is therefore suffering. Um, another set of charts, inventories. During COVID, and many of you heard me on, on, on In the Know, talking about double ordering, triple ordering, quadruple ordering. Okay, what happened? As a result of that, too much inventory. Look at how much above trend inventories are. And in the GDP accounts, they have a not even started falling. Um, and so that is, along with unemployment and consumers pulling back, that is the other reason we believe we're going to have a recession this next year, this correction in inventories, because the prices went too high and the consumers basically said, no way. And then finally here, many uh, people say, well, with the AI boom, surely technology is going to be immune here. No, a lot of capital spending leading indicators are, are pointing down. Now, this is probably um, more the high fixed cost kind of capital spending as opposed to software. Uh, but you can see even software, the intellectual property, uh, and this is in real CapEx, it's a component in the GDP accounts, it has started to come down uh, in terms of growth rate. It was very strong, mid-teams, now it's uh, high single digits. We do think AI will buffer this, um, uh, but as you can see during a recession, it can go below zero. You can see intellectual property, uh, likewise, it's down at zero. And computers and peripheral equipment, uh, that's in a recession and has been in a recession. Why? Because uh, households and businesses bought so much during COVID. This is the other side of that. Um, so, and I will say as far as AI goes, um, the, the, the corporate uh, strategy officers, CEOs, chief technology officers, uh, all of them, I think now, especially after OpenAI's drama, uh, when Sam Altman was out and then he was back and uh, all of that, uh, a lot of corporations began to say, wait a minute, uh, we were putting all our eggs in that basket? That doesn't seem too stable. Sure, they have the best large language model out there, but there are others that are good enough. And so we think open source has more of a shot because of that. And of course, open source is free. Um, but we do think there will be second sourcing. And so, and, and a rethink, wait a minute, all of our divisions are doing this differently. Let's have a unified strategy as a company. And this often happens in the early days of innovation, where you have a burst of activity, and then you have corporations saying, wait a minute, we need, we need to have a strategy around this. This, we can't just throw spaghetti against the wall. And we do think that could cause a, a bit of a hiccup. And then finally, market in, uh, indicators here. Dollar. Many people call the dollar weak. If you look at the dollar and you look at it in perspective, it is up about 40% in the last decade relative to other currencies. And with the exception of uh, the, the early 80s, it is near the higher end of a, a long-term range. So I want to put that in perspective. A strong dollar is anti-inflationary, if not deflationary. In the early 80s, it was deflationary. And uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy authorities around the world basically worked together to get the dollar down because it had become too deflationary. In the next chart, commodity index, you know, uh, uh, commodities are priced in dollars. And here you can see, uh, really, it's for the last, uh, I'm going to say, 15, 20 years. We're in a downtrend in terms of commodity prices. And today, breaking below 100, we are where we were in the early 80s. This is not an inflationary chart. In fact, if anything, if you look at the last decade, this shows a downtrend in pricing. And we think uh, that the Fed will do a double take uh, as it reassesses during the next year. Here, I showed you this chart a couple of uh, months ago. The metals to gold ratio, so that's metal price index divided by gold price index, um, that is the purple line. And it is near its low. Uh, it's been highly correlated to long-term interest rates, uh, especially since the 08-09 crisis. Look at that beautiful correlation. 
They're basically running together until 2022 and 23. And when we first presented it, I think it was in October, uh, the long-term treasury yield was up five, and you could see this uh, metals to gold price index dropping. Uh, we do believe that uh, that interest rates are the long-term interest rates are going to continue down this year, and that they could they could hit two percent. We put that as a question mark when we first presented this chart, but you can see this um, purple line is still going down. Uh, and so it's basically calling for Fed ease. Uh, gold to oil ratio is the same. The one thing I'll say about this, though, this is basically saying uh, gold's purchasing power is going up. And when it breaks through 30, we're usually in some kind of crisis situation. Um, as you see in 0809, it didn't even need to break through 30. But 2015-16, there was a uh, a China implosion crisis, the Chinese uh, devalued, and uh, that put a shock through the system. COVID, of course, was a major shock. Well, we're close to that 30 again. And, you know, what, what could go wrong? Well, debt, too much debt, It not so much in the government sector, but in the corporate sector, maybe the consumer sector, and bankruptcies. The one thing I'm looking at and we are looking at is private equity rushing in. Uh, to provide loans out there. And so while banks are saying no more and cutting back, private equity is in there saying, no, nope, here, here, uh, for this very high yield, we'll, we'll fund you. And uh, I don't think that's going to end well. I don't think that's going to end well, unless we have a burst of economic growth. Uh, and so if it's not going to end well, I'll end by saying innovation solves problems. And actually, Yassine stole my punchline. I was going to use it at the end of this in the know. Uh, and that is that Bitcoin is a risk on asset, but it is a risk off asset as well. And if there are going to be bankruptcy problems out there, uh, then having a vehicle with no counterparty risk in, your, in a portfolio will become more and more important over time. And so with that, I'll say once again, Happy New Year, and uh, thank you for letting us share uh, our thoughts and, uh, and our outlook with you. 